My name's Kashif Siddiqui and I'm a professional footballer. I've played for the Pakistan national team at international levels and made my debut in the Beijing Olympic 2008 Olympic qualifiers and I've gone on to represent them in the AFC Cup and also the South Asian Cup. Currently I'm one of the few Asians playing fortunately in the UK. I was born and raised in West London um, and I went to Harlington Community School and it's from there where I started my journey to be a professional footballer. Uh, it's been a really long journey and a tough one to be honest. Um, when I left school I, I got uh, selected to play for Middlesex County. Um, that's when it all started kind of really and when people told me that you know I had the ability to maybe play a little bit of football beyond but just normal school football. And uh, from there on I went on to play with Arsenal schoolboys and I was there for about two, three years and from then it just really kicked on. I signed on professional at the age of around 15, 16 with my YTS scholarship with Boston United and it was really difficult at the time because I left up home at such a young age and I was living in the middle of nowhere to be honest. Um, in Boston, you know, Lincolnshire and I was in and out of digs at a lot of different people's houses and I found it difficult to adapt to the culture. So after my scholarship there, I eventually decided to take a scholarship to get away from you know, the dynamics of English football and how I was kind of perceived at the time as an Asian footballer trying to break through. Um, and that was a journey really, and that's when I started. And what it really kicked off for me was during that time at Boston United, the Pakistan national team were looking for South Asian people from origin that were involved in professional football in the UK and they contact the FA and uh, through the FA I was selected to go out for a trial um, and through that trial I managed to get on the under 18s team and from there I broke into the under 21s and I made my debut in the 2008 uh, Olympic qualifiers against Bahrain and Qatar and Kuwait and from there you know, I managed to break into the first team <coughs> and it's from there where I got an opportunity to get a scholarship to America and that's when I decided to leave the UK to get something like a good plan B in case I didn't break through as a professional footballer. Because in the USA, it's a, I think it's a, almost a better scheme, whereas they give you, you an education at the same time. Like I see a lot of today, like a lot of my friends that were breaking through as professional footballers are now not really doing anything because they haven't got any like, plan B to fall back on. So for me, it was a solid plan B to go to America, get a degree, and um, play professional football, be in a professional atmosphere to try and break into professional football. And um, I didn't actually finish my degree because I was uh, then signed on professional after two years and I left and I went to California and from there then I played uh, professional football. Being one of the South, few South Asians um, in the UK who's broke through, it's, it's really, um, it's difficult because I've been so close to it and I've worked so hard to get where I am is sometimes I forget, you know, the niche that I have and, you know, and some of the other footballers and what they're facing to try and break through the barriers. But I. I really think that gives me a lot of responsibility and being one of those few South Asians puts a lot of pressure on me as well at the same time and I want to try and be the best role model I can and give back at the same time whilst trying to achieve the best I can in the game. Um, hence I started the Gashi Siddiqui Foundation with the FA and the PFA to help young South Asians you know, and help their parents understand what it takes to get to the next level. So I think um, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. But I think you know um, things are really looking promising, and um, I'm hoping that more Asians will follow through. But you know, I'm here to support in any way I can to help that journey for them. I think it's. I mean, a lot of people ask me this, that question of why there isn't any many South Asian footballers. But I think there's so many dynamics to that question. And um, you know, when I got back from the USA, I met the FA, and we sat down. We spoke about what my kind of experiences were and what I thought. And I think that one of the main things is opportunities abroad to highlight those. Also the parental engagement and culture and making parents understand 
how they can help their kids because if it wasn't for my mum then I wouldn't be where I am, I wouldn't be able to do it for, as on my own. St George's Park is amazing because the facility here is just second to none. It's like you're getting the best treatment by the best trainers around the world. Um, sorry, the UK. For example, you know, some of the staff here work with the England national first team and stuff, so it's good for us to get um, hands-on treatment because sometimes you don't get hands-on hands -on treatment at the club. Um, and um, the Professional Footballers Association basically fund it and really helped and they've really supported me a lot in my career off the pitch and on the pitch. I'm actually normally. You've got to stay away from that section. Right. Can I get a dungeon potato, please? Can you? With um, tuna. Carbs are good. And no my dream, please, just butter. <laughs> so I said to the chef that I don't have a margarine ever because it's got vegetable on it, it's bad for you. So butter is good for you and coconut oil. Everything is good for you in moderation. Moderation. And you really can't oil as well as petrol. True. And water. And water. Okay, I'll be coming back there. Do you know the definition of nutrition? No, what is it? What's the definition of nutrition? What is it? The definition of nutrition is something that sustains life and growth. So everything is nutritious, but some things are more nutritious than others. Oh, I like that. So, yeah, could I get um, tuna, please? Okay. With light mayonnaise. Light mayonnaise. Um, um, uh, coleslaw, please. Your coleslaw with light mayonnaise, made with fresh ingredients. Um, cucumbers, bell peppers, half a five a day. Yeah. Uh, tomatoes, a little bit of sweet corn, please. Okay. Sweet corn is one of the only vegetables you can't digest. Really? It's a new one for me right there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm very passionate about all the charity work between the KSF Foundation and Football for Peace. That really takes up most of my time. As soon as I finish training, I'm usually, you know, on conference calls. Um, like today, for example, I was training, and in between training, I still found time to meet with the football associations about a plan with uh, Football for Peace Global. My injury started in 2005 when I was when I first went to America. Um, I went to shoot the ball and someone came and blocked me. And unfortunately, the ball rolled and um, I hit the bottom of his boot and I ended up smashing the right foot and smashing the joints in my foot. And ever since then, um, they wrongly diagnosed it and I was out for two years. And from that, I came back and it was diagnosed as a Liz Frank's joint sprain. And from then, I, um, over the last years of coming back, developed a uh, tear on my hip because of muscle imbalances. And in 2009, from then, I was diagnosed with a hip labrum tear. And it's been really difficult since then because I've got a lot of muscle imbalances and every time I train, I come back and I get injured again. And because of the, the hip problem now, I've got a calf issue, 
we've got ankle issues and today we're working on just releasing the calf again because I've recently strained it again and I've been out for six months with it. So it's um, a case of, you know, three steps forward and two back for me every time. So it's difficult, but um, we're getting there. Okay, he's putting needles in my foot. It's like electric, electric acupuncture, but it's a lot worse. Ah! Um, it gets really deep into the, to the muscles and, and kind of circulates the, the blood flow and separates the muscles because when you get injured you get a lot of scar tissue so the muscles combine together and the scar kind of gets really hard and then you get continuous pain so every time you train you can't, the muscle doesn't move because of the scar tissue so the, the needles get really deep inside and they kind of circulate the, the nerves and the flow of the muscle. Um, because of my calf strain, I've got um, I've developed a uh, nerve trap in my left foot as well. So it's been a nightmare. So we're working on that today as well. So we're releasing the nerve and then releasing scar tissue through my calf. And once the nerve and the calf let go, then it will free my hip again to start moving a bit more freely. So it's just a case of bringing all the muscles together and being a bit more mobile. Hi, my name's Ian Aylward, I'm the lead strength and conditioning coach here at Perform St George's Park. Yeah, Cashy's rehab's going really well. Obviously, um, he's had a tough couple of years uh, with, with different injuries um, that have started in the hip and moved down into the knee, but pleasingly, over the last few weeks of his time here at St George's Park, we've been able to increase loading in the gym and obviously maximise that with a little bit of exposure to pitch-based conditioning as well. Um, so we're just trying to really fingerprint where cash is in relation to normative values within football itself. Um, and that's nice and progressive, so we've started with some linear-based drills that have been quite extensive in nature and just try to maximise his heart rate around the 85% max level and then we progress that with some open skill, close skill activity with the ball and without the ball just to make it more football specific and then pleasingly we've moved into acceleration deceleration drills as well as change of direction activity so we're almost there just a little bit more hard work to do really to push on just to get that functional fitness ready just so we can cope with the normal demands of week in week out training back in a club environment. Yeah, so the, the hypoxic chamber is just a way that we can get a dose response through a player where we can just increase physical workload, especially for repeated sprint activity, which obviously footballers are, are involved with over a vast period of time. Um, so the hypoxic environment allows us to get um, changes in the mitochondria and the capillary density and length, just so you can start to use oxygen more effectively um, at those higher intensity. I'm really grateful to the Professional Footballers Association because they've given me the opportunity to get back to full fitness and without them I would have really struggled because at the club obviously there's limited resources and you know time for the physios to put into me but here I'm getting hands-on treatment at St George's Park but apart from that the Professional Footballers Association have been so hands-on with me and really supported me being you know one of the South Asians playing and also helped me set up the Cash Siddiqui Foundation and are also now really helping me support set up Football for Peace Global. So, you know, I've just got to really take my hat off to them and say thank you and um, I owe a lot to the PFA. We're in the perform room now, just um, doing some recovery after a, some training, a hard day of training today. Um, and this is just decompressing all the inflammation that I have in my leg and allowing me to recover for tomorrow's training session again. As you guys have seen this week, from Monday to straight through through to Friday is my everyday lifestyle of training 
for six, seven hours a day, and then having the rest of the evening to try and recover and do, you know, foam roll, massage, acupuncture, and ice baths to get me ready for the next day. And the plan is to hopefully get my body to a stage where I can maintain that fitness for at least a month or two and have a solid pre-season because in the last three, four years I've only, I haven't had a whole full season and hence when it comes to January time my body's broken down already because I'm weak. So the plan is to just have a rehab season now and get ready for pre-season and get my body as strong as I can and be fit as I can at this stage and hopefully have a um, good season ahead of me and that's the plan. I co-founded the Football for Peace movement and also started the Kash Siddiqui Foundation in partnership with the Professional Footballers Association and the FA um, because they really helped me get, get to where I was and I wanted to give something back. And the Kash Siddiqui Foundation is a, it's a health and sports charity to inspire young South Asians to get into sports and especially girls and to give them an opportunity. And this year I'll be launching um, an academy to help young Asians to get into sport and we can help bridge the gap so they understand what it takes to get to the next level. Um, and through that, I was fortunate enough to be put in touch with the South American legend Elias Figueroa and he had a concept called Football Pour La Paz, which puts on peace matches in South America through, the, through my agency and you know the people that manage me. And basically I was fortunate enough to co-found Football for Peace Global and brought Football for Peace to this side of the world in Europe and we're officially going to launch this year and the aim with Football for Peace is to inspire understanding between communities and people because I think there's a lot of problems in the world today you know being a South Asian footballer and a Muslim footballer myself I think I have a responsibility to show people that what's happening in the world is it's not a portrayal of Islam or you know what people think it's it's, it's different people's views and experiences so Football for Peace is about creating dialogue and inspiring understanding between people and uniting people through football and um, we'll be officially launching this year in 2015 with an aim to put on peace matches globally with the United Nations. Uh, again, I'm really fortunate because, because of the charity work that I've been doing and it's kept my mind really off being injured because, you know, all the other footballers, they finish and they go, they go home and they go out and, you know, whatever they're doing. And with my, with my life, is, over the last two years, it's been as soon as I finish training, it's into the charitable work. And I think it's open doors to me that I never thought would open. And I've been really fortunate. I was invited to Monaco last year to be inaugurated by Prince Albert II of Monaco as a champion of peace. And that again was, you know, a great opportunity for me to kind of, it's like a pinch myself moment to realise where I am in my life today. And, you know, every day is a stepping stone and every month is a stepping stone for me. And I think the, the harder you work for the greater good, the luckier you get. And that's been a story of my life so far. And meeting Prince Albert and all the people supporting me right now has really helped me. My, in my ventures and in my mission and vision and you know now being under the high patronage of his work and the support that Peace and Sport of Monaco are giving me is opening doors around the world at a government level at you know federation level to so my achievements and my vision comes to life one day. Long-term goals um, I want Football for Peace to be a global movement and it's not about me it's not about Elias the co-founder or anyone else the movement's about everyone it's about the community it's about getting as many footballers for peace around the world to support the movement and believe that they can help their own societies and become champions of peace in their own kind of rights. And Football for Peace is about bringing all these footballers from around the world. It could be an amateur footballer, it could be a, a legend, it could be a professional. Um, but giving them a voice and giving them a platform to give back to their community and to understand that everyone can create dialogue and unite people through the power of sport. Last year I was fortunate to travel with uh, the Gold Illuminado, you know, our partners in uh, Chile for Football for Peace and we went to Easter Island to implement a project with Pele and that was an incredible experience because we spent a week on um, Easter Island and we put on a match with the Rapa Nui tribes and bringing all the different tribes together and I think that was a real eye-opener because um, living in London sometimes you think that our problems you know, just close to home but you don't realise that halfway across the world that same problem of miscommunication and understanding between cultures is something that's happening all over the world. Success for me would be for me to just stay healthy to be honest and to try and help as many people as I can. As a child I had a dream of changing one person's life 
and I never knew that I'd be in a position to change hundreds and thousands of lives. And that's one of the main things that I want to do now because I believe that, you know, we only have one shot at this life and I want to leave a legacy behind so when I'm not here that people can still, you know, live and thrive off something that we have created together and which will make help make differences as we move on. There's many lessons that I've learned in my life. However, um, I've been really fortunate because my mum's been a cornerstone in my life and she's taught me a lot. She's taught me, you know, to appreciate things in life. And I think with that ethos, I haven't made many mistakes. You know, everyone makes big mistakes and I've from mistakes, but I just think that with my mum's blessings that I've been fortunate enough to, you know, stay away from that. And as long as you appreciate what we have in life, I don't think you go far off things. If I was the most influential person in the world, but that's not to say I'm not going to be yet. I'm still on my journey. Um, my, main, my main aim is to help people understand that they need to understand others. And that's exactly what the brand DNA or Football for Peace stands for. It's about inspiring understanding. And that's my mission and vision. And it's to bring people together and help them understand other people's faiths, cultures. Um, because I think that's the underlying problem in today, in a day and age like this, where people are just not understanding each other and you see all kinds of conflict happening in the world. For aspiring footballers in the next generation, you know, my, my main thing is always there's no substitute for hard work. You have to work hard in life, but you have to believe in your dreams. As long as you have good intentions, you can get where you want to be, but you have to put the hard graft in. And the main thing is that listen, always listen. I think listening is one of the most important things in life. And if you can listen and respect other people around you, you'll be good and hopefully have a successful journey, whatever that is. My last advice to anyone trying to take a career in football is be strong. It's um, anything in life, you've got to be strong and you've got to keep believing in your dreams because you will get knocked back. I got knocked back. So many people told me, you know, you're not big enough, you're not strong enough, you're not quick enough. Um, but I didn't listen and I'm still fighting today. Unfortunately, I've been fighting injuries. But the main thing is that you have to believe in your own ability. And, you know, I was told at a young age that 70% was hard work and attitude to make it professional and 30% was talent. And I live by it today and, you know, I think I've done enough to, you know, believe in myself and what I've done. But I think, um, yeah, there's no substitute for hard work. Thank you for watching my success story in UK Vibe TV.